arrived at Magrack. And now, classic cars. A car that swims? A boat that drives? Who needs a trailer? Drive in and drive out, no messing about. Sure, it might be a novelty now, but there was a time when inventors dreamed of amphibious cars and motorcycles in every garage. Bridges and ferries would become a thing of the past, and making a splash would certainly beat sitting in traffic. Yeah, those were the days. In the end, it seemed only the military wanted a machine with an identity problem. But just when you thought it was safe to get back in the water, the amphibious car is poised to make a comeback. So snap out of it, land lover. Get some sea legs as we dive on into the wild and wet world of Amphicars. Are we in the water yet? In 2003, an old idea took on a new look. Capable of 100 miles an hour on land and over 30 miles an hour in the water, the Gibbs Technologies Aquata made its debut. It's part sports car and part speedboat. With wheels that tuck up into the wheel well, the Aquata is a streamlined new chapter in the long tradition of amphibious cars. The Aquata looks to end a long drought in production of this rare breed. Its predecessor, the Trapel Amphicar, is about 40 years its elder and remains the only civilian amphibious car ever to be mass produced. The Amphicar wasn't exactly a raging success and its factories have long gone quiet. But today, a devoted group of Amphicar loyalists keep the machines alive. Chief among them is Ampha enthusiast Billy Six. Billy, a one-time drag racer, has a car restoration business in the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey. Billy can fix about anything on four wheels, but his passion is fixing and driving Amphicars. Billy isn't alone in his crusade. Around the shop, you're likely to bump into part-time Amphicar goddess Leslie Digiani, the metal magician Rob Toscano, a kitten rescued from a trash can in the Philadelphia subway, and an aging Vizsla named Ginger, who can't seem to get enough of Amphicars. The dog uh, is very difficult to contain when it comes to Amphicars. Billy's business, East Coast Amphicar, may just be the only shop in the world that specializes in Amphicar restoration. He currently owns two of them, Splash and Krusty. Bill picked up Krusty back in 1994 when it was an unfinished restoration with most of its parts in boxes. Billy did just enough to make it seaworthy and ever since it's been the beater car of the family. Krusty's been stuck on rocks and even been stranded on a dam. It's been in salt water, given endless rides, and made over a thousand high-speed splashes. Krusty's got something every tired old Amphicar needs. Well, no, not a high-power boating permit. A good bilge pump. One-inch PCV pipe out the back doesn't instill the passengers with a lot of confidence. This is uh, 2,000 gallons per hour. So this is, like, this is like a fire hose when it goes off. But don't be fooled. Krusty can still swim with the best of them. Billy's other Amphicar, Splash, is in better shape. We think this might be why he lets his friends drive Krusty while he rides in Splash. Splash is my second Amphicar, which I was able to spend a lot more time working on because I already had Krusty in the water, so I wasn't in a hurry to do this one. So I took more time and did a nicer job. I decided to leave the interior out of the back so I could see how many people I could fit in here. I also left out the convertible top folding part, they call it convertible top irons, and I've had as many as 15 people sitting back here, including the dog. Today, Billy and Leslie are installing an engine and transmission for a customer. The Herms transmission is 40 years old and brand new. That's because years ago, a forward-thinking Amphicar enthusiast in California went on a scavenger hunt in Europe and found all the remaining transmissions still in their crates. When they were first put on the market, they sold for $700 a pop. Now they sell for $7,000. All right, fresh from Germany. Before going in, the shiny new transmission is hooked up to a greasy old engine and attached to the hoist. <laughs> You Volkswagen specialists aside, forget everything you've learned about installing an engine. This one's going in the back. Let me show you what it's like to be an Amphicar engine. 
Hi, this is what it's like to be an Amphicar engine. These are the axle tunnels here. This is where your rear drive axles come through. The transmission's gonna sit right between them. Then a big rubber boot clamps down between those two areas. You gotta make sure those clamps are tight because if one of these boots comes off, the amount of water pressure that comes in here, you have two minutes. If you take a look over here, these oblong holes are where the propeller shafts come out of the back of the car. Because of the unique requirements, the Amphicar company had difficulty finding an engine. The Mercedes 194 cylinder was too heavy and the Volkswagen Pancake wouldn't fit. So the Amphicar became an unlikely diplomat in Euro trade relations when they struck a deal with Standard Triumph of Britain. The Triumph 1147cc four-cylinder wasn't built specifically for Amphicar. The sturdy 43-horsepower model originally designed for tractors was the perfect fit because it performs well at long-duration constant speeds, exactly what an Amphicar does in the water. Whose idea was it to make steel cars and then put them in the water? Germans! <laughs> the master race. True, the Amphicar's original design was rust-prone, but the company hoped that if the car were given a chance, improvements would follow. By the mid-60s, they planned to have a much more rust-resistant design with greater use of fiberglass and other materials. But the Amphicar never really caught fire. Governments didn't exactly welcome the idea of having cars splashing across rivers and lakes. Meeting all the requirements meant overhauls and rising costs. In the U.S., Amphicar sold for $3,400, likely to cause a good case of sticker shock in 1960, especially when you could pick up a Volkswagen Beetle for $1,200 and have money left over to buy a pretty good boat. With no real money for improvements, the first model year Amphicar was basically the last. By 1968, just over 3,800 had been produced. Publicity stunts like this tried to ignite public interest, but to no avail. Most of the Amphicars sat in the factory parking lot, and since then, they've been slowly going extinct. Back at Wild Bill's shop, the battle to keep them afloat is ongoing. The big problem, of course, is rust. When it was built, the company used cardboard between the body panels to dampen vibration. Obviously, cardboard holds moisture, and rusting, particularly around the quarter panels, is an Amphicar epidemic. This is flat gauge steel stock, 20, 20 gauge stock. And this is what the car was made out of. So we buy this in sheets and cut it to size. It seems a little strange to build a boat out of automotive grade steel, but back in the day, that's where the technology was. But some inventors figured a way around this. If the car body didn't get wet, then what's to worry? As far back as the early 30s, that's what an inventor down in Dallas had in mind. They've always done things a little differently in Texas, and the auto boat was no exception. Here, the power is transferred from the wheels to the water with a series of rollers and belts. Step on the gas and off you go. Just pray the wheels don't jump the rollers, otherwise you're really going for a swim. Some folks kept the vehicle dry by making the wheels so big and bulbous the driver sat high above the fray, or in this case, the swamp. While the auto boat and big wheel swamp trucks kept everything nice and dry, others embraced the water completely. And what better way of doing that than with an amphibious motorcycle? You got it. In Spain, inventor Antonio Carbona figured out a way to keep his engine going under a couple of feet of water. Underwater, the wheels keep turning and the bike kept going, although clearly without the zip of its land-bound brethren. While the civilian market was slow to embrace the amphibians, the military took a keen interest. Crossing rivers and moving armies from boats to shore became the key to Allied victory in World War II, and it was these rare 1930s prototypes that pioneered the art of the amphibious assault. On the Axis side, Ferdinand Porsche and other auto designers had a go at building amphibians. Conquering the countless rivers of Europe and Russia was right in line with the German Blitzkrieg style of warfare and the first effective automotive size amphibians were born of German ambitions. Because of their rear engine, rear wheel drive combo, these amphibs were also amazing climbers. Demonstrations like this one in Rome trumpeted the prowess of the amphibian. It was these German wartime advancements that led to development of the Amphicar. In fact, the Amphicar's designer, Hans Trappel, had actually been a member of the SS. 
But back in South Jersey, it's hard to make much of the Amphicar's Nazi roots. In fact, the car was specifically designed with fins to make it more appealing to Americans. The car really looks more like a shrunken 57 Chevy or Sunbeam Alpine than anything else. But at the gas station, it's always fun to see people's reactions. The gas station also presents a dilemma unique to New Jersey Amphicar owners. State law requires full service for cars and self-service for boats. So what's a gas station attendant to do? Better back off and leave this one to the experts. Fueled up and back on the road, it's time to do what Amphicars do best. Krusty and Splash are headed for the water. Amphicars might not be the hottest thing on the road, and in the water they're not exactly gonna break any records, but they can do both, and how many cars can claim that? Although Billy frequents this ramp, there's always someone who is seeing an Amphicar for the first time. Sometimes they sneak off with them and I don't know. Then they come back and there's seaweed hanging from them. You can put somebody innocent in an Amphicar and then head toward the water and scare them and say something like, oh my God, I lost the brakes. And their eyes get very large and they scream. Billy's friend Scott has never driven an Amphicar in the water, so it's time for a little brief on the do's and don'ts. Some go without saying, don't run over buoys, stay in the channel, and whatever you do, don't open the door. But really, the most important thing for the Amphicar neophyte is a quick lesson on the unique transaxle system and its two shift arms. The Amphicar shifts on land with this big shifter, four speeds, shifts in the water with the small levers. You push the propeller forward, the propellers are in forward, and you're boating forward. Put it into neutral, that's for when you want to stop and do some trolling or some fishing or whatever else you might want to do. And if you need to back up, this is your break. So now, time for the big splash. So when you hit the water, just engage the clutch, put the land drive in neutral, the propeller drive forward, and you're off to the races. Well, at about seven knots top speed, let's just call it a cruise. In any case, here goes Scott. A successful splash, and he's an Amphicar virgin no more. A few hours in leaky old crusty, he'll certainly earn his sea legs. Probably the only thing better than getting a reaction on land is getting a boater's reaction on the water. Can you tell me which way the Garden State Parkway is? <laughs> Anyone who's driven an Amphicar will tell you, the only thing more fun than getting in is getting out. As you approach the ramp, the shifting sequence is basically reversed. Put the clutch in, put the land drive in first gear, release the clutch, and when you feel the back wheels hitting terra firma, pull the propeller drive back to neutral. Is this Pismo Beach? With engine in the back and rear wheel drive, the little Amphicar is an impressive climber that rarely gets stuck even on mud and rocks. Wait a minute, enough of this land stuff. Time to get back in the water. Next stop, Atlantis. And now, the $64,000 question for all you land lovers. What steers the Amphicar in the water? A rudder? Nope. Differential power to the propellers? Wrong again. In the water, the Amphicar is guided by the front wheels, just like on the road. Of course, in the water, the turning isn't quite as responsive, and as any boater will tell you, wind and currents also have a say in the matter. Front wheel steering means less moving parts and fewer things that can go wrong. Of course, in estuary systems like this, with their shifting tides and channels, there's always room for error. So it's a good idea to bring along some spare Amphicar parts. And I've learned, after having Amphicars for years, that you carry a spare propeller with you. The propellers are plastic, and they're supposed to break if you hit something. That's called your shear point. The new Aquata solves the shear point problem by keeping its moving parts out of harm's way. The Aquata doesn't plow through the water like the Amphicar, it skims or planes across the surface. This was done by overcoming three basic design challenges. The first was to create a system that allowed the wheels to fold up while staying connected to the drive line. The second was developing an internal jet pump that was light, compact enough, and could integrate smoothly. And third, the Aquata team reconciled the conflicting issues of aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. In other words, what's good for a car isn't necessarily good for a boat. This revolutionary compromise means speed, something new for the amphibious class.
Back in South Jersey, the little amphicars continue to putter around at about five miles an hour. It's been a few hours in the water and Billy's getting a little batty. I see you in. Splash is still bone dry, but old Krusty is taking on water and the intrepid crew is getting their feet wet. For his first day out, Scott's done a pretty amazing job, although he admits to hitting the brake every time he wanted to slow down. Nice. The bilge pump is working overtime, and the crew is wishing they'd brought spare socks and shoes for the chilly ride home. But that's life with Ampicars. Life with the Aquata looks like a whole different ball game. With its 30 mile an hour water speed, you can get where you're going a lot faster than in an Ampicar, and you'll probably keep your feet dry. The Aquata is an amazing machine, but there is still one thing we haven't mentioned. With a price tag of about $225,000, you'll probably want to check with your wife before writing the check. We'll have to wait and see what the future holds. Who knows, the Aquata could catch fire and critical mass could drop the sticker price. But until that happens, the Amphicar remains the only mass-produced amphibian ever to hit the waves. It may not be the best car, and it may not be the best boat, but as long as they continue to swim, the Amphicar, like its biggest fan, Billy Six, remains truly one of a kind. Consider that here we are with a 1960 car that was really just a dream put together on a, a whim and a budget and nobody wanted it. Uh, I like to describe it as the window in history that opened a couple inches and a couple thousand of these shot through and that window slammed shut. Well, that window is never gonna be open again and here we are with these little machines 40 years later, and they're still doing the job that they were doing back then. So prototype or not, rust bucket or not, the designer and the inventor of these, he did a pretty good job. That's why they're still around.